Ambernic has had a crazy year. 90% of their products that they have launched have somehow made their way into my bin. They must have fallen off my desk or something. But a couple of them just so happen to be some of their best handhelds ever made. Now towards the end of the year, Ambernick has decided to launch a bigger handheld, something that has more screen real estate and something that can emulate Dreamcast, GameCube and potentially PS2 games for a respectable price. Ambernick has a history of poorly priced products in my opinion, so I was intrigued when I saw the 150 price tag of the RG505. It's likely they have seen the incredible sales of the previous Retroid Pockets, knew that they would have a larger handheld coming out this year, and wanted to eventually compete with it. And that's basically what they have done, but in Ambernick fashion, it's one step forward, two steps back. And before I jump into the review, I just want to quickly state that our book, A Handheld History, is now back in stock with a few hundred units available just before Christmas. So if you've been waiting to snag one, now's your chance as we won't be restocking them until mid next year. So now, here's our full review of the RG505. First of all, you'll notice that Ambernick has updated their packaging. It's slimmer and you'll no longer get a wall socket included. Instead, it's just the handheld, a cable, manuals, and an added screen protector. My first impressions as I pulled it out of the box was that it feels very light for a handheld of this size. And when I shake it, there's a lot of buttons rattling and just overall clutter. I don't know why, but when something is oddly light and sounds like a cereal box, in my mind, it just screams low quality. In terms of design, I don't actually mind the way it looks. This Game Boy Color variant is my favorite of the bunch, and the simple button layout on the face is easy to understand, with embossed text instead of the awkward printed text that you can see on the RG353M. But the more I look at it, the more the screen bezel just sticks out to me. And it's one of the largest screen bezels I have seen all year. Something I know many of you viewers dislike in handhelds. Between the oversized bezels, you will find a five inch OLED touchscreen display with a resolution of 960 by 544. Perfect for playing PSP games in 2X resolution. And I had no issues with it. It's bright, it's sensitive to touch and does the job well. The buttons are well suited to the device and the action buttons don't stick like some of their previous handhelds and the analog sticks are whole joysticks which are much higher quality than normal. But through my review process, I did notice some flaws. The first being the D-pad. As much as I like it, it's firm, a great size and has a nice responsive touch. I don't like the fact that when I press the down button, it likes to go right. Small things like this happen in almost every Ambernick device I own. There's always something however big or small, and today it's the D-pad. It's likely easy to fix for me because I can just plow my way through unscrewing the back, but for a newcomer that doesn't feel comfortable taking off the back, it's incredibly annoying and a bit of a game changer. And then the shoulder buttons are just very poor. A handheld of this size should feature stacked and flared shoulder buttons. These are too small and too loud. And I find myself ha having to push them down really, really hard to actually to get them work. They're just terrible. There's been no quality control whatsoever on this device. Around the sides, you'll find your buttons and ports, for example, your USB-C charging port, a headphone jack, volume buttons, speakers, SD card slots, the world's smallest on-off button, uh, a menu button, and the Ambernic buttons, which shows your games in their kind of new OS, which I might add is so bad that I find myself always using the Android apps instead, it's just simpler. One thing is missing though, and that's the HDMI out. Personally, I never use this feature. I have other gaming systems that I go to if I want to play on the big screen. But for some of you out there, I know this will be a bit of an issue. So take that into consideration if you are thinking of buying one. Then finally on the back, you have these signature grips, which I think do need some updating as they're starting to look a little cheap and a bit outdated. How they do this, I do not know, but I'm keen for something different here. 
In terms of comfortability, it's not the worst and it's not the best because it's so light, it can be played on in bed or on the sofa comfortably. But little to no innovation or attention has gone into the ergonomics of this device. It's pretty basic aesthetically. However, it does start to impress me when I dove deeper into the gaming experience. And remember, I'm doing this all through the Android operating system. Inside it features the Unisoc T618 chipset, the same as the new Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, with a Mali G52 GPU and 4GB of RAM topped off with 5000 milliamps of battery. Upon receiving this unit, it didn't have the Google Play Store, so I held out on this review in hopes Ambernick would sort it, and I can confirm they have done just that. New orders will have the Play Store installed, and those who already have their device will receive an automatic update that adds it for you. This was actually quite a nice and appreciated update, and I like to see Ambernick and others do this more automatically through Wi-Fi. I installed my emulator apps and added my ROMs and was ready to game. And like I always do, I just jumped straight into the deep end and so immediately had to test PlayStation 2 emulation. Firstly, I tested Marvel vs Capcom and was pleased to see it running fairly well, close to flawless in fact. This isn't the hardest PlayStation 2 game to run, but it's a great start. And then I decided to jump straight in with my favourite PS2 game of all time, Burnout 3 Takedown. And this is where the PS2 performance kind of stops. Once you get into the big 3D games that are quite strenuous, you're, I'm basically getting like 20 frames per second out of it. So Burnout 3 uh, Takedown was a pretty poor experience. And the same with another game that I enjoy is Need for Speed. You know, this is just far too much for the RG505, which, you know, I have to respect because this is only a $150 device. So even playing some PS2 games is respectable, but going into the library a bit deeper, I would say most games do not run well on the RG505, PS2 games I was meant to add. In terms of GameCube emulation, the RG505 is very good at playing these games. Through testing, I noticed very little issues. I had high frame rates, no crashes, and the audio was just great. GameCube is pretty much where the Arjo, Arjo? RG505 flourishes the most. Anything above that, and you'll start to see a decrease in performance. I then tried PSP in 2x native resolution on one of the most intense PSP games, and it worked really, really well. The screen resolution makes it look incredibly crispy and I hate to say it I actually prefer playing PSP games on here rather than original hardware and I'm glad the 2x resolution works because it was plastered all over their marketing material and from their past history sometimes it can be a false claim but not this time then of the big consoles you have Dreamcast again it runs incredibly well, which should be the case as older, less powerful devices can run Dreamcast games very, very well. When I think about it, it's quite impressive that a $150 device can emulate GameCube, PSP at 2X, Dreamcast, and some PS2 games. This market is moving incredibly fast and the competition is bringing down the prices, making this level of emulation more affordable. And because the RG505 runs on Android, you can even hook this up to your cloud gaming services such as Xbox Game Pass. And although the text is a little small and it relies on a good connection, the overall experience ain't half bad, you know, for a cheap device like this. This opens it up to even more gamers who not only want to play retro games, but also want to dabble on some games through streaming too. The 5,000 milliamp battery allows for around six hours of playtime uh, on the device, but it all kind of depends on what emulator you are using, what games, what brightness, etc. But you know, four to six hours continuously across the board is what I was getting. The stock OS though still needs a lot of work. It's not user friendly, nor is it easy to get to grips with. And combined with the D-pad issue, the shoulder button issue, and the very average look aesthetically, it pulls the overall experience away from being great. And also entices people to get the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus for the same price, which doesn't have these aesthetic issues. Ambronic took a shot here, albeit a respectable shot, especially when it's rare that they challenge competitors' prices. But in Ambronic fashion, 
they cut corners and didn't innovate enough to make this a great handheld. It's simply just okay. It was saved by its pricing in all honesty. $20 more and I would have said some bad things about it. So there you have it, a quick short guide about the RG505. I apologize that it's not super in depth. I had like four or five handhelds come through the office at once. I'm a, I'm behind, I've got the KTR1, which I know a lot of you are excited about. I've got the Evercade EXP and the GKD Mini in. So if you wanna see those reviews, hit subscribe. They'll be coming out in a couple of weeks, just before the ultimate, the best, handhelds of 2022 video that you've all been waiting for. So thanks for watching. Make sure to check out a handheld history that's now in stock and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.